Listen to me. If there was a wise man who would ever think of this, they would say in order to be superior to the man, you've got to be the man. For I am the man himself. going on and how y'all doing this early Friday evening. This is the Club of the Man 1993 and we are here, not live, I wish I was live, but you know, because you know, schedule's winding down, but still probably going to keep these weekly reviews pre-recorded for now just so I can have a little more flexibility uh, with uploads and whatnot. But we are here once again. Because remember, guys, in order to be superior to the man, you've got to be the man. And for I am the man himself. Did that out of order completely, but I got to get back in the habit of saying this. But we are here for my AEW Dynamite review from the July 5th, 2023 edition. As we continue the AEW tour of Canada, as this episode took place in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. We'll go over everything that happened on the show. Uh, I think the next big event that they're building to actually, besides, of course, Wembley Stadium, is Blood and Guts. And, of course, we are officially going to be getting Blood and Guts between the Elite and the BCC. There's an interesting twist, though, to it, though, that we found out on this show. But overall, this is another great episode of Dynamite that I enjoyed. A couple things that were... Decent, not quite, a little weird. The ending was was definitely a little bit odd, I will mention that. But we got stuff more with the Blind Tag Team Eliminator Tournament. Outside the fact also that some of these teams, like, I wish there would have been like a promo or something like that to lead up to Keith Lee and Swerve teaming up on this. But I did enjoy the promo that they had before that opening match. And a lot of people are saying this, and I'm hoping it's true as well. But hopefully that's a sign that AEW is ready to give Keith Lee a gigantic singles push. And we'll talk about that momentarily. But we're going to get rolling. Again, I'm on, I'm on a good pace. We'll do AEW now. Maybe SmackDown tonight review. We'll do that. Because I do plan on watching Collision this weekend and doing a review for Collision. I will, of course, make a separate um, playlist now, as I will occasionally do some collision reviews. Again, I know I'm over the hood, but I definitely wanted to see this weekend's episode because they're doing CM Punk versus Samoa Joe. And I was very interested in that match. So I will do that this weekend. Um, but yeah, let's roll and get started to talk about this show. Again, a lot of good things happened on the show. A lot of interesting things happened. Some storytelling progression. Of course, the best stuff of the show, no, this, for this episode of that about it, was definitely the stuff with Adam Cole and MJF. I love that stuff, especially. But we're going to roll in. We're going to talk about it. The show opened up with a, with a blind tag team eliminator tournament first round match. It was the blind team of Darby Allen and Orange Cassidy who actually turned out to be a pretty solid team, they took on the formerly known team as Swerve in Our Glory, Swerve Strickland, and Keith Lee. Of course, they're no longer a team, but they were blind back together. Um, Again, I keep saying, though, that I just don't get why they dragged their feet with this. This team's been broken up for how many months now, right? Why haven't we gotten this match yet? Like, all out or all in, they better do it by then. Because I don't know what they're waiting for. Then they keep dragging this feud out. But anyways, before the match started, we have this backstage promo. 
with Renee Paquette interviewing Darby Allen and Keith Lee. Darby tells him he was at one time the most dominant champion here. And if he feels lost in the shuffle, he should do something about it. Even if it means winning this match two on one. Tells him to get his head out of his ass and he'll keep an eye on which Keith Lee shows up. Lee calls him stupid, but ballsy. Because he just fired him up. And like I said, a lot of people are hoping that that is a sign that AEW is going to start giving Keith Lee a a bigger push. Because, let's be honest, anytime you know that Keith Lee is not a focal point, it's very obvious. In NXT, it took them a bit to get the momentum going with him. He kind of just like sat in the back and, you know, just like let the other stars shine. Which that's okay if you're doing that. But a talent like Keith Lee especially, when we finally see those matches where he's doing the maneuvers that I always say where he like, he always seems to have that look on his face like, you guys are going to be shocked I can do this. You guys are going to be shocked I can do that. He always has that look on his face. And when he goes all out, like no pun intended, like he does with um, his, did it with his matches with Dijak and whatnot, you know he's a star. So, again, they've been, just like now, I mean, his debut match last year against Isaiah Cassidy, he went all out. But ever since then, like, they've kind of, like, slowed down a little bit with him. But it might be time that they may be giving Keith Lee that singles push. But, um, the match started, Keith Lee and Darby Allen were in the ring, and then Keith Lee then obviously knows Darby. I think Darby just like slapped him across the face, getting fired up. And Keith Lee just dominated. He like, he did like the, his vicious overhand chops and then his grizzly magnum and just like chucks him across Darby across the ring. And Darby sold it like a pro. He definitely was starting to, you know, just he took Darby's advice. Of course, though, eventually, um, uh, Keith Lee walked up the steps with Darby trapped underneath them as, um, I think Swerve put him there, which was genius to get more heat on Swerve. Uh, but eventually, though, um, after Orange Cassidy was able to hit a suicide dive DDT on Lee, um, Darby Allen was able to get back into the match, and he won the match with the Last Supper. And it obviously showed again that, that Keith Lee wanted absolutely nothing to do with Swerve. Because he even like kind of like laughed off the loss and just like showed a sign of respect to um, Orange and Darby. And um, yeah, hopefully again that is off to the races. We got to get Swerve and Lee for either all in or all out. Again, that is going to be phenomenal. And Swerve, I keep saying this. When Swerve's got the momentum and he's had the momentum lately. He's killing it. Like, like, again, I would not have been opposed if he would have won that, that title a couple weeks ago on um, on um, on Dynamite when he fought Orange Cassidy. I thought they could have put the title on him because it felt like the iron was hot for him. But we will see. Hopefully we'll get that match soon because that match I am dying to see. Swerve Strickland and Keith Lee, it's going to be freaking awesome, I feel we then know we weren't done with Darby Allen. He has this video package talking about the passing of his trainer, Buddy Wayne, and how he promised to watch over Buddy's son, Nick. And I guess Nick is this 18-year-old kid, and I guess he's going to be making his debut match next week? There's some been some rumors of some good hype for this kid, so he could be, you know, the newest hook, maybe? Well... In a way of like, you know, we had Hook like a year or two ago as like the young kid who's breaking out. Now, of course, Hook's had the experience, but now we're getting ready to see Nick Wayne come in. Could he be this year's Hook? We'll have to find out. But speaking of Hook, we had Tony Schiavone waiting for Jack Perry to arrive. I, I don't know if they're calling him Jungle Boy still or not, but I don't think they, 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 they will be for a while, for now. But so Jack Perry arrives. 
He comes out of his car and says, last week was ridiculous. He's not some thug from New York. So if Hook wants to handle this, they'll do it like professionals in the ring with the FTW title on the line. And then out of nowhere, Hook just jumps Jack and starts beating him down. Jack was able to like, get in the car, get in the car. He dived back in the car and drove away yet again. So he wants to fight Hook. But there's no doubt he's afraid of it. But I do look forward to that match. I do think Jack gives Hook his first loss. I think, you know, I think he, right, that, that, that he'd be the right person to do it. And right now, really, if Jack, Jack, if Jack Perry, I'm going to try to call him Jack Perry, is not going to get his spot at the top of the title, then I'll take him getting the FTW title. Like, to me, that's... It feels like, again, like I know Taz brought it in for his purpose. But I feel like the, those who have held the FTW title, Brian Cage, Ricky Starks, Hook, it feels like a future star's title. And although Jack Perry has basically already proven himself, he needs some type of a rub to keep his stock high. So I do agree if they want to take the title off of Hook and put it on Jack Perry... Go for it. Be my guest. So I'm looking forward to whatever that match happens. Maybe they'll wait till All In. Who knows? Um, and then we had the first of the um, of the um, Adam Cole and MJF moments. So they were training, and then MJF made fun of some heavy set indie wrestler. And then Adam Cole was not having it, but then he kind of like added in a joke himself saying, although he did kind of look like Tony Schiavone. I didn't like the overweight joke because I don't like people making people fun of people. I don't like people being made fun of for their size. I don't like that. But I do like how like, you know, Adam Cole acknowledged that, but he also tried to at least keep things cool by saying, but he did kind of look like Tony Schiavone basically or whatnot. But, um, so that was just cooking for, again, what was later to come. Um, we then had the Bollywood boys, Gerv and Harv, Sira and the Blade. I guess the Butchers hurt. I don't know. But I think they were the same Bollywood boys from um, WWE. But they took on the acclaimed Anthony Bowens, Max Caster, and Scissor Me Daddyus! It was a solid little match. Uh, the acclaimed one. Afterwards, though, I guess they're continuing a storyline with the acclaimed and QTV, which John Morrison, or Johnny TV, who is officially signed with AEW, is a part of their group now, which intrigues me. Um, we have that Harley Cameron, who I believe a lot of people is, is like circle her as like the new like hot blonde um, in wrestling that everybody's got their eyes on. Uh, she shows up and cuts a promo about how she's going to get Anthony Bowens to leave them and join up with QTV. And then basic, basically, even though uh, Anthony Bowens like, told her file on sleep that, hey, I'm sorry, but I'm gay, um, rejects her, even though, dang, like, you know, I, I, guts to Anthony Bowens is sticking with, you know, what he, who he truly is as a character, of course. But dang, like, yeah, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, which I gotta watch what I say, because again, I am married now, but I don't think a lot of guys are gonna be turning down Harley Cameron. If Harley Cameron would hit, I mean, again, I would never pick my wife over anybody, but I'm pretty sure any other guy would pick Harley Cameron if she came on to them in a heartbeat. I'm pretty sure she is, she's that type of character. But anyways, of course, you know, she basically says, you know, you didn't allow me to show off my rap skills. I'm going to, next week, we want to show you some of my other attributes or whatever the heck it was. I was making some jokes in there. And, but then anyways, um, Billy Gunn says that she gets on the phone tells her to suck it. <laughs> oh, God. It, it, it's so awkward, but it's entertaining. I do enjoy it. it it's, it's kind of a nice little rub for QTV. Um, again, I'm also interested to see, of course, what they where it goes with John Morrison involved as well. But that was entertaining. 
Uh, we also have John Moxley cutting a promo on Eddie Kingston, who I believe just won the New Japan um, Open Heavyweight Championship, whatever heck it's called. Um, so because of that and how he's going to be involved in the G1 Climax or whatever heck that tournament's called for New Japan, Eddie Kingston will not be able to wrestle in the blood and guts match for the Elite. Uh, we also it was also revealed that Brian Daniels since Brian Danielson is hurt, the BCC are down a teammate as well. So the question, of course, will be who will be joining the teams. We already know the fourth member of the BCC is going to be Kanosuke Takeshka, uh, with him Moxley, um, him Mox, um, Takeshka Moxley. Um, Claudio and Wheeler who be the fourth member Don Cal is trying to do some recruiting on this show now for the elite we've got Kenny Omega Hangman Adam Page um, the Young Bucks the fifth member people keep saying could in fact be Kota Ibushi which of course I'd love to see because I, I like when Kota was in the Cruiserweight Classic in 2016. I really haven't had a chance to see many of his matches since. But maybe the rumors are true and he will be that fifth member. And that would be awesome if he was. Um, but anyways, Moxley um, um, talks about Eddie Kingston. Where there is to be mad about and why he stays so focused on the past. He's dreamed of Eddie who embraces the future and becomes what he could be and what people want him to be. So they are probably building up for a match with Mox and Eddie. We saw them feud um, in 2021, I believe it was. Yeah, 2020, no, 2020, because 2020, uh, he defended, because Moxie was champion, he defended against Eddie and then Eddie, of course, turned face when he um, protected him in the Bar exploding barbed wire death match at Revolution 2021. Anyhow, though, we're probably gonna be in a roles reverse match for all in or all out. Cool with me. I like this. Uh, Renee Paquette is also standing by with Matt Hardy to find out his blind tag team partner for his match on Rampage. They pulled a name, they said it's Jeff, and then Matt's like, Jeff, my brother, which of course wouldn't be able to happen because. Jeff Hardy can't travel outside of the United States because of his history with or with drugs and whatnot right now. But it was actually Jeff Jarrett. And Matt was disappointed. Again, I definitely, again, not a, really the biggest fan of Jeff Jarrett. But knowing that, I mean, I don't know much about it. But they probably have a history from TNA or Impact. That is a little interesting. We'll see what happens with that. What, what they do with that. We also have Wheeler Yuta cutting a promo about how he's the real favorite going into his main event match with Kenny tonight because Kenny is battered, bruised, and he's already beaten him. So he's going to end him tonight. Referring to, I believe, the um, the match recently, um, or no, 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 the Anarchy in the Arena match where Wheeler pinned Omega, I believe it was, which again... I like that they were kind of like for a few weeks giving Wheeler a little bit of a rub here. Although, of course, one on one, I didn't think Wheeler was going to be beating Kenny. But speaking of which, we then had Canada's own Chris Jericho come out. And he kind of played more so tweener here because he acknowledged his home crowd, he didn't completely shit on them. But he got the job done, what we needed to do in this segment. So he comes out and says it's bittersweet to be here because he's had a lot of losses to his name and things haven't gone the way he wanted lately. So it may be time to reevaluate and make some changes. And the providence of Alberta is the perfect place for him to be reinvigorated, seeing as he trained here under Stu Hart and had his first match only just an hour away. He got here a couple days early, drove up and down the highway to reverend this about the passion and fire of when wrestling was everything to him and remind him that wrestling still is everything to him. He feels refueled and it's time to become the best version of Chris Jericho ever. And it's true, Jericho's 
suffered a good amount of losses lately this year. It has kind of felt like, you know, is... Because, like, usually when Chris Jericho has a character, he doesn't... He puts a lot of guys over, but he also wins a lot of match, some matches, too, to help keep his credibility. And if I'm being honest, lately he's not really been winning many matches to keep that credibility. So I was starting to kind of lose interest. And again, I'm also... Is anybody else done with the JAS? And it's time to just let all these guys be free and be themselves. Because like I said, I, I love the inner circle. The JAS... Other than like a brief moment with Daniel Garcia, like besides the other former inner circle members, I haven't cared for it. I haven't. And I guess... Mostly because I just still look at Matt Menard and Angela Parker, formerly Ever Rise and NXT, as jobbers. I just don't think they're, they benefited much from this. So yes, Chris is right. It is time to refuel and start fresh. And he may have that perfect opportunity by sticking with the guy who came out next. Probably has some of the biggest heat in AEW. I say AEW because he contends probably with MJF, of course. Um, well, right, not right now, based off of this um, episode. Uh, and, of course, someone who has massive heat in WWE, Dominic Mysterio. But Don Callis comes out. He reminded Jericho about when he called him six years ago about doing wrestling Kenny Omega in the Tokyo Dome. And he claims without that match, he believes that none of the people today are here. And Chris Jericho wouldn't be where he is without that match. Jericho also mentions how he helped Don back into the wrestling business and into AEW. And how he's bigger and more powerful than ever. So if it weren't for him, Don Callis may not be here. And Callis says when they get together, they make history... And was recently betrayed by a coward punk named Kenny Omega. So he's began a new family. One that's based on trust. When he thinks about trust, thinks about the greatest of all time. The man who beat Kenny Omega and his best friend of 34 years, Chris Jericho. So he asks Jericho to join the Callus family. Teasing him becoming that fifth member for the Blood and Guts match. Jericho thinks it over and he's like, are you serious? And Don's like, yeah. Jericho mentions the only thing is though is I don't join factions. I create them. So my answer is one word. Maybe. And he walks away. So Jericho wasn't a full on heel in this promo. But it intrigues me. Because it I, it probably is time for Jericho to do something different. Because again, the JAS stuff, again, it's really run its course. I'm not, again, I'm not the fan of 2.0. Daniel Garcia's had his moments, but... He's not been the same since the whole you're a wrestler storyline. We were teasing him leaving Chris Jericho for Brian Danielson. That was some great storytelling. I can't stand Jake Hager and his stupid ass hat. It's time for Sammy Guevara to be a singles baby face again. It, 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 it's time. I, I'm, just, I'm just not digging it anymore. So him joining up with Don Callis, I can do that. I dig it. So we'll see. I had another name in mind. Who should? Who's that other name in mind for the fifth member for the heels? Dang it. Oh, man, I had it. And I lost it. Oh, Will Ospreay. What if Will Ospreay would have... If it's not Jericho, what if they had Will Ospreay be the fifth member of the BCC team for, for Blood and Guts? Which I do like that idea. But we'll, of course, wait and see. Uh, we got a video packages hyping up Samoa Joe and CM Punk for the next uh, match in the Owen Hart Cup tournament uh, for the semifinals, I believe it is, uh, tomorrow night on 
uh, collision. And then backstage, we see Roderick Strong, who I guess I didn't get to watch his match on collision, but I guess he had obviously had suffered aftermath from the um, from the, his match with Samoa Joe. Um, Roddy says he feels great. And he wants his train wants he wants to train to tell him to be cautious. Adam Cole rolls in and gives him encouragement. But then Roddy's like, um, what's going on? I, I noticed you're getting too friendly with MJF here. And then Cole reassures him, though, this is just for the tournament. But, of course, after tonight, we're wondering, is it just for the tournament? We then have um, the, another first-round match, and it was Adam Cole and MJF's match against the random team of, oh, this makes sense. Butcher is not hurt. Butcher, I'm sorry, I forgot. He was in this tournament and he teamed up with Daddy Magic, Matt Menard. And of course, they made some pretty easy work and won with the boom from Cole on Daddy Magic. But afterwards, though, oh, no, 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 no. We ain't done. Afterwards, MJF rushes in and takes Cole off his feet with a hug. And then Cole's like, okay, okay, this is getting too weird. But MJF, though, grabs a microphone and says, any devil worshippers in the house tonight? Any fans of a guy with a super cool name? And he didn't ask Cole if they should have another bro session this weekend. Adam Cole was like, okay, sure. And then MJF puts down his title and wishes Cole a happy birthday. And then all of a sudden, streamers launch out. He calls for birthday stuff. And the crew comes out with hats and balloons and a cake and party favors and like everything. He's going all out. Like this is, this was pushing like festival of friendship type caliber. And of course, um, MJF then puts a hat on Adam who is just like, what the hell is this? And then he starts singing a soulful rendition of Happy Birthday. And then, um, and then, and then of course, after a bit, Cole cuts him off and says, whoa, whoa, Max, Max. I appreciate all this. And, and, and MJF's going, like, all out, like, all into this, like, Obviously, again, the eventual story is going to be MJF is going to turn on, on Adam Cole. But they're making this worthwhile while it's at it. Again, th stuff like this is reminding me of like when MJF was trying to become part of the inner circle with Chris Jericho. And it's reminding me of the days of uh, Team Kevin and, and Chris. Chris Jericho and Kevin Owens. Again, this reminded me of the Festival of Friendship in some ways. But um, anyways, he tells him he appreciates all of this, but you've done more than enough. But MJF is like, nope, one more thing. Tells him, make a wish and blow out the candle. Cole then blows out the candle and smashes Max's face into the cake. And they both just like laugh it off. And then Cole samples some of the frosting off of the forehead, deeming it very good. And then everybody starts chanting, eat the cake, eat the cake. And Cole says, with all sincerity, this is very nice. And he thanks him and calls him his friend. Oh, man. <laughs> MJF again can be a very, very convincing baby face. But then, of course, he will easily stab you in the back. And this is just another round of it. Again, I... I am very entertained by this MJF and Adam Cole stuff. Like, like I said, it, it's reminding me more and more of like Chris Jericho and Kevin Owens. And it, 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 it's entertaining. I love it. It's not going to last long. He's going to definitely probably turn on Cole when they don't win the match. When, when they lose a match. But, you know, it works. But, um, but yeah. So speaking of which, and we still got to see um, this promo at some point, but we got Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, which yes, I want to see a match. I mean, not a match. Well, I want to see a promo war with Britt Baker and MJF. 
And also, because I just started, which I still kind of suck at it, but I'm still getting used to the controls. Apparently, you can do intergender matches in AEW Fight Forever. I would so definitely want to do Britt Baker versus MJF. That'd be a heck of an intergender match. But, anyways. She's getting ready for her match with Ruby Soho in the first round of the Owen Hart Cup tournament. And, of course, Britt Baker beat Ruby last year to win the tournament. Um, and she mentions how Ruby cannot take her pride and she's going to win the whole tournament once again. Um, we also have an interview with Renee Paquette interviewing Chris Jericho, Daniel Garcia, and Sam Guevara. Uh, Garcia asks, what do you mean by maybe to Don Callis? And then Jericho says it means maybe and sometime they'll have to branch out for themselves and do great things without him. Renee then tells Danny that he and Sammy have been teamed up in the Blind Eliminator. And Jericho tells him to show him who can be the leader here. And then Garcia tells Sammy to finish what they started. And they just fist bump each other. Okay, I mean, that one's not super blind. But we'll see. Again, the eventual, which also, actually not think of it. If it's not Kota Ibushi... Maybe if Jericho does join uh, the BCC's team for Blood and Guts, maybe Sammy joins the Elites for Blood and Guts. Because it's pretty obvious that, again, they're slowly teasing Sammy breaking up and having the teacher versus student match. Uh, probably at either all in or all out uh, with Sammy and um, Jericho. Which, that will be good. That's been a match waiting to happen since the beginning of AEW. Uh, Britt Baker then took on Ruby Soho. Th again, this is where the show started to like fall off a little bit, if I'm being honest. This match was fine, but... Again, Britt is definitely working hurt from what I heard. She might want to take a break. Um, and again, it was just typical stuff uh, with the outcasts interfering. Ruby does beat Britt, which is a good move. It's just, it's once again just feeling super repetitive though with the outcasts. Like, yes, Tony Storm's champion, but can this get something else too? Because again, we're seeing the same people keep getting involved. Yes, I know Thunder Rosa is still not going to be back for quite a while. Um, but can somebody else get involved in this? Because again, this is just getting super duper repetitive. Also, what was weird though is the outcasts were, um, were, um, were um, like still like going after Britt throughout the whole match, but then afterwards, Sky Blue comes out on the ramp and stares down at Ruby Soho. Why didn't Sky Blue come out to help to help Britt Baker? Cool, because Sky Blue is going to be Ruby's next opponent, which I think they're doing it Saturday tomorrow night. I'm not sure, but my thing though was why did Sky Blue come out to help Britt Baker? That was a little awkward. And then we had the main event, Kenny Omega and Wheeler Yuta, which was also a good match. But then afterwards, when Kenny won with the one-way angel, afterwards, and this is where the show got cut off. Um, I didn't get to see all of it. But Claudio Castagnoli comes out and attacks Kenny with Kanosuke Takeshka. But then the Young Bucks and Hangman Adam Page come out to make the save. But as they're coming out... Um, the show cuts. Well, because I, 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 I had a DVR in it. So then I turn on the YouTube clip. And apparently Hangman tees up with a chair. But then the Dark Order slide in and took it away from him. And then just like that, the show ended. It was kind of abrupt. And the past two weeks, I feel like that they've been kind of like... Having those abrupt finishes, the same ones we would get in WWE when they kind of like end the show very abruptly. So that took me out a little bit from this. But again, I do like that they're adding they're adding this little wrinkle into the storyline to give to obviously set up for further down the line with Hangman and Dark Order. I don't know who he'll be feuding with from there, but they're trying to make things interesting because, again, Hangman is out of the blue, left Dark Order, went back to the Elite. So, nope. So, um... 
so yeah, we'll see where that goes. Um, but that was um, but that was dynamite. I'll give the show a B plus. Again, I really enjoyed it. The last like couple things were decent to solid. Like I said, the match with Ruby and Britt was okay. Again, it's obvious that Britt's working hurt right now, so that kind of affected it a little bit. And then again, like I, I did like I, I again I was taken out a little bit also with the with Sam Guevara and Daniel Garcia being teamed up. Like that doesn't feel super random to me. And then the main event match was good. It's just that that ending getting cut off. It kind of just took me out of it a little bit. But gave the B plus. Still a great show. Again, the stuff with MJF and Adam Cole was awesome. So just the whole birthday party thing was just great. I loved it. Um, but yeah, again, I will hope maybe to get to SmackDown tonight for you. We'll see. And I do plan on checking out Collision this weekend to see CM Punk and Samoa Joe. And I will do a review on that show as well. I did mention I was going to do a turn alert for Shayna Baszler. But I'm going to wait because it may be... Because I don't think WWE has made it very... Even though she cut a babyface-like promo and the crowd reacted to her like a babyface... I don't know if they're going to go full on, full on babyface for Shayna Baszler, or if it's just a temporary thing. We'll have to wait and see. Because might be a thing where they want to make Ronda the face, but Shayna's the face because she spoke the goddamn truth. But we'll have to wait and see, and hopefully again get more video game stuff going again. Because I did start again, but of course I'm not ready yet to start uploading yet. But I did start again. Once again, though, the channel's getting cooking again, especially to where 110 subscribers last I saw. 110 away. Actually, let me double check while I'm here. Let's go to my YouTube page real quick here and just see how many subscribers I got. It's taking a second to load. Be patient. I just want to see how many I got. Did, did I get to 1,900 yet? I think last I saw I got 1,890. Come on, come on. I want to see the number. I want to see the number. This might get boring, I apologize. Might be a little slow since I do have the recording going for... Um, review i got it 1900 exactly as of today so as of today i am 100 subscribers away from 2000 let's keep it going guys we're almost there so hopefully i will get that hopefully this weekend i will also get the um the last short from my 2018 version of my worst wrestling matches of all time in as well. And hopefully I maybe get that video in, 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 done in the next week or two. Hopefully we'll see. I've been dying to do that. I do want to do my SummerSlam preview predictions. Which again if you didn't see the announcement. I will be going to SummerSlam. In a very, for a very you know, cheap nosebleed section ticket. But I am going with my wife and two nephews. Um, and yeah. Again, the channel's going to start cooking again big time. Especially we're 100 subscribers away from 2,000. Thank you guys, of course, always for, you know, supporting my channel as well. But yeah, 100 subscribers away from, from 2,000. Let's see if we can get to it by the end of the year. So guys, I gave Dynamite a B plus this week. What are your guys' thoughts on this week's episode of Dynamite? Leave your thoughts down in the comment section below. Be sure as always to slap a like on the video and subscribe for more content on my channel. And follow me on Twitter at the Club of the Man 93. And also follow me on TikTok and Instagram at the Club of the Man 1993. And until then, guys, I'm checking out. I'll catch you guys all later. And don't forget, in order to be superior to the man, you've got to be the man. And for I am the man himself.